What's gone wrong in South Sudan? As the world's newest country marks five years of existence, fighting continues, famine is just a short step away, and the country teeters on the verge of economic collapse. So what is there to celebrate? And who's to blame? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Street battles in South Sudan's capital, Juba, are threatening to reverse the gains of a recent peace process on the eve of the country's fifth anniversary. But how did the euphoria of independence from Khartoum just five years ago end so soon? After civil war began in 2013, negotiators poured over the details dividing the rival camps, not least on how to integrate government and rebel fighters who'd split largely along ethnic lines. And now, almost a year since an agreement between President Salva Kiir and former rebel leader Riek Machar was signed, the merging of the forces still hasn't happened. Well, Riek Machar returned to Juba in April to take up the role of first vice president in a new unity government. It was hoped his return could help the reconciliation process. More on that later, but first let's take a look at how South Sudan got here. What many consider as the collapse of the state began soon after it broke away from Sudan in 2011. Civil war began just two years after independence, when President Salva Kiir fired his deputy Riek Machar. The army split along ethnic lines and fighting forced more than two million people out of their homes, those who could cross into neighboring countries for safety. But those who were trapped in their own country faced severe hunger and aid agencies reported relief supplies were often blocked from reaching those in need. What remained of the government couldn't react to the needs of its people, mainly because of the fighting over the oil-rich territory. Oil production itself slumped, leaving a hole in South Sudan's treasury. And despite a regionally brokered peace deal in August last year, old rivalries seemed to prevent South Sudan's leaders from implementing the agreed unity government. Well, let's listen to what President Salva Kiir and First Vice President Riek Machar have to say about their commitment to that peace process. The problem that you know we are not moving smoothly on the implementation of the agreement are the issues the way the agreement was designed. And when I signed this agreement in August last year, I said it in front of the presidents of IGAT. I told them that this agreement was not made to be implemented. Implemented? Uh, by the spirit and the letter of the agreement. Because the agreement is a road map, uh, first for reform and for establishing a new system of governance in the country, which will lead us to democratic elections. OK, let's introduce our guests for today's show. Joining us from Juba is Ateni Wekateni. He's spokesman for South Sudan's president, Salva Kiir. In Boston, we have Alex Dewal, who is executive director at the World Peace Foundation at Tufts University and an author on South Sudan. In Washington, D.C., we have Justin Lynch, an editorial fellow at the New America Foundation. Justin has worked extensively in South Sudan. Welcome to you all. Let's go to Juba, of course, on the fifth anniversary of the existence of South Sudan and ask uh, President Salva Kiir's spokesman, what has gone wrong with your country? Yes, uh, the state house was attacked yesterday while uh, the president and the first vice president as well as vice president were on the meeting uh, to push forward the implementation of the peace agreement which um, it was signed last year in August and, uh, and uh, which has culminated also into, um, uh, into uh, the formation of uh, transitional government of national unity. Uh, and while the three men were discussing, uh, the uh, attack happened and it was started by the, uh, the, uh, the forces of Riyadh Machar. Uh, the bodyguards were actually outside uh, J1, uh, the state house. And uh, 
while uh, the, the three men were sitting, the fighting erupted, and, um, and the whole confusion, you know, started to, um, you know, uh, to rage well, on. Well, how, how, why uh, are you so sure? The three men did not know sorry, uh, sorry to what interrupt. was the source of fighting. But why, are um, you, why are you so sure that these were, this uh, fighting was conducted by the forces of Riek Machar when Riek Machar was in the room alongside President Salva Kiir? So why are you so sure that these were the forces of the opposition? First of all, uh, the genesis of this started on Thursday when um, uh, the forces of, of Riyadh Machar attacked, um, you know, our forces uh, in a, in a place uh, called um, uh, Lau uh, Clinic uh, in uh, Gudela, uh, killing five uh, soldiers. And at the same time, when uh, Riyadh Machar was called uh, to come for uh, a meeting of the three men in order to come and foot forward uh, the, the security measures that will enable those forces, the forces of Riyadh Machar and the forces of, uh, uh, you know, of, of the Sudan People Liberation Army, uh, you know, uh, in a working uh, relations. Uh, Dr. Riyadh Machar, of course, came. Uh, he, he did not have any, um, uh, anything that will show he, he was planning for any attack. But his forces are the ones who actually fired okay. the first gun. Okay, so you've given, they, us, they, they, they you've given us you've given while, us an account you know, then uh, of, uh, they were of just this doing latest, normal guarding outside this the, latest the violence. Palace. Let's take that and, and put it to Alex in Boston. What does this tell us that on the eve of the fifth anniversary of South Sudan, that fighting is taking place outside and uh, attacks are being launched upon it would appear the presidential palace? What does it tell us about South Sudan, age five? Well, I think what the current crisis and the response of the political elites to the crisis show us is that they remained entirely focused on their personal gain, their own wealth, that blaming the other. No one has managed to articulate a real positive forward thinking vision of the future of the country and to take it forward. The lion's share of the blame for this total calamity, this total collapse of South Sudan lies with a set of elites who for the last five years have been entirely focused on their own power, their own wealth. They've looted the country, they've built up armies, they've sacrificed the lives of their people, the future of the nation to their own personal ambition. And would you apply that to both sets? I, I, I say both sets largely because uh, we're talking really, aren't we, about the figure of Riek Machar and Salva Kiir? I think both sides are equally culpable. I think there are, there, there are secondary errors that have been made. I think the, the peace deal that was signed had two fundamental flaws. The first is that it was a share out of wealth and power among those elites, premised on the assumption that everyone who was in government would come out of this process better off than they went in. And at a time of economic meltdown, of shrinking budgets, that wasn't going to happen. The second fundamental flaw was the, the fantasy that these two armies that were unreconciled, that were still each side convinced that there was a military solution, would be jointly responsible for the security of the capital city. It was frankly an insane idea to abandon the previous idea, which was to demilitarize Juba, put it under the United Nations or an independent third party, and bring these two unreconciled armies to jointly control the capital. And the result of that is exactly what we see now. Justin, you've recently been in South Sudan. Give us an idea of how all of this is impacting upon South Sudan's people. We know more than two million of them are dis displaced and we know that they've gone through untold no amounts of trauma. I think um, one of the things we have to keep in mind with this peace deal is that it's basically a deal between the elites. Um, the people who uh, were the leaders of this country uh, when uh, it became independent in 2011 are essentially still the ones who are in charge. And I think that many people, uh, many average citizens in South Sudan are wondering um, uh, what has independence gotten them. And I think that the numbers uh, are really staggering. Um, like you said, I think we have um, uh, uh, around uh, 5 million people who uh, suffer from uh, food uh, shortages, uh, 2 million people displaced, and in the last civil war, uh, more than 50,000 people died. So I think uh, many people uh, in the streets uh, are wondering, um, uh, as the leaders fight 
amongst themselves, um, when will the real change happen? And I think we haven't really seen that yet. Uh, Tony Weck, coming back to you in Juba, then, what's your response to this litany of accusations against the elite, uh, both, both of uh, President Salva Kiir's faction and indeed that of, uh, headed up by Riek Machar, that you are basically uh, plundering the country for your own uh, benefit and that nothing uh, nothing uh, useful can come out of the current peace deal that will uh, benefit the people of South Sudan who've gone through so much suffering for five years? Um, well, uh, if one has to actually uh, uh, assess uh, critically how um, uh, President Salva Kiir and, uh, and Dr. Riyak Machar has shown uh, their political will to work together, uh, you would find in the yesterday incident uh, when um, uh, the, the, uh, the fighting erupted outside, and, uh, and those who started the fight, which are actually the forces of Riyak Machar, were thwarted. Uh, President Salva Kiir protected um, uh, uh, Dr. Riyak Machar. And Riyak Machar has been in the custody of President Salva Kiir until uh, in the evening, around uh, 11.24 uh, minutes uh, local time, uh, you know, c close to midnight, when President Salva Kiir instructed uh, his commanders uh, to escort uh, Dr. Yagmachar to his resident. Okay, if okay, you're talking was, about. Uh, sorry, to, to, sorry to, to jump in there. Uh, Yagmachar? No, he you're, left yesterday. Sorry, he left yesterday. You're talking about one specific incident. We're trying to concentrate a little bit more broadly on what is on the table in South Sudan and yes. the way forward. Uh, what is the way forward, given that the current peace deal upon which uh, the, the existing well, the government of national unity is based is, has been described as exceedingly faulty? So what is the way forward? Well, well the yesterday incident has actually summed up all that, you know, President Salva Kiir and Riyak Machar can work together. And they have actually, you know, yesterday, you know, uh, proven to the world that, you know, they are brothers in a state of enemies because uh, their forces fought, you know, to, to oblivious, to oblivion, and, but yet uh, President Salva Kiir protected Riyak Machar. Uh, if you see them, the two men are actually serious uh, to carry on, you know, although uh, there are challenges economically that are actually hampering uh, the process of, uh, of making uh, the transitional government of national unity workable, simply because the international community that was promising, uh, the, 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 the warring parties, the former warring parties, uh, to, uh, uh, to sign peace agreement, you know, in an attempt to return the country to normalcy before they start supporting the government, have actually dragged their feet, and uh, they have left the people of South Sudan alone, uh, though uh, they, are, you know, they are to be appreciated because uh, their intention is to make uh, uh, South Sudan a peaceful okay, country. Okay, all right. And, okay. and the two men are actually serious. All to right, well, that let me take that point. Goes back to normal let's state. take that point and let's put that to Alex in Boston. Alex, are you convinced then by what uh, Atani Wek describes as a show of unity between Riek Machar and Salva Kiir, uh, certainly uh, with regard to the, this attack on the presidential palace? Does that convince you that the two men are prepared to work together? It looks a little bit to me like the unity between a, a jailer and a prisoner. Um, it, I, I suspect that Riyak Mashar now has really no, no freedom of action if, if what's happened is, is, is that his forces have been physically uh, defeated or even eliminated in Juba, then, um, then such national unity as there might have been, or pretense of national unity, I, 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 I don't think exists. But the fundamental point is that there wasn't any trust. The only thing that could make them work together was some sort of accommodation of their joint material interest. And they had shown no ability to, to work together in anything other than the most short-term and, and tactical manner. And the idea that this would be resolved by free elections down the line is, is a fantasy. The reason why the situation blew up at the end of 2013 was they could not agree on who would be the candidate of the ruling party, the SPLM, for those elections. And that question is still not resolved because whoever is that candidate will be the next president and they are still locked in that um, unresolved uh, life and death political struggle. And Justin, this moment has been described uh, for South Sudan as a fork in the road uh, that the leaders uh, for, for good or for bad, can either choose the Mandela route or the Mobutu route. That's the way this moment has mm -hmm. been described for South Sudan. Would you agree? I certainly think that that's accurate. Um, I think what many diplomats say is that this is the last chance for South Sudan. 
the international community um, has given a lot of money, they've given a lot of time to uh, South Sudan, and I think that uh, what they say is that uh, if this peace deal falls, uh, falls apart, um, that uh, they will uh, likely pull out uh, their political uh, and perhaps uh, financial support to the country because they need to be shown uh, that these leaders are serious. And I think one of the things we have to keep in mind, too, is that it's not just Riyadh um, uh, and President Kiir, it's the people around them who are also driving this. Both leaders uh, have extremists, um, or uh, uh, hardliners, I should say, who are in their camps, who are just as influential um, as they are. And uh, those leaders, uh, it might not be in their interests to have peace in the country. Um, Attorney Weck, we uh, earlier played a little clip from an interview that President Keir gave to Al Jazeera just a few days ago. In it, uh, he sounded f much uh, less convinced that the current deal upon which this government is based is actually implementable. How committed then is President Salva Kiir to establishing this government of national unity and working towards elections. Riek Machar, on the other hand, believes it is implementable and that it's a, it provides a roadmap towards democratic elections. But the president doesn't seem so. Uh, president Salva Kiir has made it categorically clear that you know, uh, he's actually ready to implement the peace agreement in letter and spirit, although he has expressed earlier that you know, the way that the agreement was designed was designed by those who have designed it in order not to be implemented. But simply because the people of South Sudan has no alternative other than for them to fool together as the people of the same country, you know, in order to stop, you know, foreigners from encroaching into their uh, own affairs. President Salva Kiir saw no alternative except to implement the peace agreement in letter and spirit. And he has done that and is leading on that. And the well has to believe President Salva Kiir. What he has said about uh, uh, the, the provision of agreement being designed not to be implemented does not mean that he doesn't want to implement the peace agreement. Does uh, President Keir feel any sense, yes, they, of respons sense of responsibility? Does he feel any sense of guilt, perhaps, for the trauma that the people of South Sudan have been put through, certainly for the last five years? Does he feel guilt and responsibility? He has also made it sufficiently clear uh, that, you know, he has apologized to the people of South Sudan as required by uh, the, uh, the, the Arusha Agreement, which uh, tried to unite the SPLM as a party that, you know, in which uh, the, the differences that culminated into 2013 crisis began from. So President Salva Kiir uh, apologized to the nation, telling the nation that, you know, they have made mistake by going to war, which was uncalled for which was sens sens senseless, and, and he has to be believed for that. And at the same time, he wanted to implement peace agreement in order to return the country to normalcy. The president, self Akir, is on record. He's a man who loves peace, and, and the world believe him. Even yesterday, one is, is an indication. Dr. Yak himself can attest to this, that President self Akir is a peace-loving man. Otherwise, he would not have even made it back yesterday to his house. Alex, um, what in, in this great, uh, it sounds pretty cata catastrophic, doesn't it, South Sudan today, but is there anything upon which to build for the future? The great positive thing that we can see is the capacity of the people, the patience and the tolerance of, of the ordinary people of, of South Sudan who've been through so much. And I think if, if uh, they were to be consulted, if it were possible to bypass the, these corrupt and bellicose elites who have so betrayed their people and actually bring the, the ordinary people of, of South Sudan to enable them to have a voice, not to vote in some fraudulent election, but actually to articulate their views, um, in, in, in some consultative process, um, I'm sure the people of South Sudan have, have the wisdom and capacity to, um, to resolve uh, the, the crisis that they are facing, not, I suspect, with the current leadership of this country. I have to put that back to Ateni Wek. Uh, the elite of South Sudan, the political leadership, has been described as uh, corrupt and bellicose. Fundamentally, you have failed the people of South Sudan. That's wrong conclusion. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, when you describe corruption, you will find that you know, uh, corruption is not peculiar to South Sudan. Uh, the whole world has corruption, but uh, countries try to minimize corruption. 
and the, uh, and the President of the Republic of South Sudan has shown his political will to ensure that he brings to book those who, are, who have actually corrupted on public money. And he did, you know, called for those who have actually corrupted on public money uh, several times. But when he wrote actually to, uh, uh, to those who are actually criticizing us for not, uh, you know, taking a fight on corruption, uh, you know, uh, the, it, the letters was, were, were actually turned down and, and President Kiir was not helped. Nobody uh, among the international, uh, you know, uh, actors that has disclosed that so-and-so, South Sudanese leader, has assets in any country, whether in the United States or Canada or Australia. They have not come to disclose whether we have assets in those places and return them like, what did, you know, in the case of Nigeria. They have not done that to us. And so fighting corruption is what we wanted to do. But we have not been helped because, you know, our country is a new country. We are still building institutions. And the institutions are the ones fighting corruption. And before we build the, cons the, the institutions, we need to be helped so that we realize who has taken what and who has taken what. Just and now you okay. see the can corrupt I, can I guys get, can I get the view of, sorry to the to that the Arabian is stronger than the country. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I yeah. see, Justin, you, you shaking your head there. Uh, there, at any yeah. way, yes. suggesting that South, South Sudan doesn't have the capacity uh, to manage itself and actually needs more outside help. Well, I think that uh, I've spoken with IMF officials who are in South Sudan. Uh, they've just been uh, moved to Nairobi uh, because of the recent violence. Uh, but they have been trying to help uh, uh, the South Sudanese government, as I understand it. Um, the international community is also helping out uh, uh, financially um, in terms of trying to build the capacity uh, of uh, South Sudanese in the central bank. Um, but I think one of the most uh, fascinating stories in the past couple weeks, um, the most fascinating uh, political stories, was a recent op-ed uh, in uh, the New York Times. Uh, the, what appeared in the pages was Kier and Mashar uh, said that they should not be uh, uh, tried under um, a hybrid court. Um, uh, almost immediately after this op-ed came out, Mashar said that he didn't write it. Um, Mr. Atteni uh, said that Mashar was involved, but I think that this kind, um, a very important point of uh, Absol should absolutely. these leaders... Uh, that you, you do, you uh, raise, you raise a very Im important element, and can I put that to you, Alex? How significant do you think is the issue of transitional justice for South Sudan in order for it to move on to a next stage? I think there's a huge clamour among the people that those who, who are responsible for the, the mass atrocities and also the, the looting of the state. I mean, this was actually a very wealthy country. It was a middle-income country, not a poor country, but all that wealth went into the pockets of the elites or into buying munitions and paying soldiers. And there's a huge clamour for transitional justice. Now, clearly, there has to be a balance between reconciliation, continuity and, 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 and justice. But the very fundamental of this is, is, is truth-telling. And the first steps have really not been um, taken on that. And, 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 and as uh, Justin was saying, there was an illusion, a created illusion that there was a consensus between President um, Salva Kiir and Vice President, First Vice President Riyak Mashar on this, um, uh, with this op-ed in the New York Times. But, but uh, Riyak categorically denied having co-authored that article, okay. and, and the New York Times admitted they hadn't actually spoken to him. Um, we're going to have to give the last word, I think, to Atteni Wek. It's uh, five years since the... Uh, uh, birth of your nation and things are pretty difficult. It's been described as catastrophic, in fact. I'd like to say happy birthday to you, but sadly uh, I don't think it will be one. What can you offer to the people of South Sudan that might allow them some optimism for the next year? Uh, we accepted your congratulatory message. We have turned five years uh, today, uh, although uh, unfo the unfortunate incident yesterday happened. But I would want to categorically make it, made it actually to people of South Sudan uh, to continue to be vigilant, uh, patient, as the country uh, and their government is actually working to pull this country forward. Uh, in terms of um, and how to improve the economics uh, of South Sudan, uh, we, the government has put measures to ensure that you know, local resources, as you know, that South Sudan is hugely actually um, uh, wealthy in, in, in national resources which remains actually unexploited. Okay. That's mean uh, I, I'm the people going to of have South to hurry you, I'm afraid. people living in a rich country. So we, we are working to ensure that we have to find solutions within ourselves 
And this is what I want to tell people of South Sudan. Our time has gone, unfortunately, at Anywek and Alex Dewal and Justin Lynch. Thank you all very much. And as ever, thank you for watching the programme. You can see the show anytime you like on the website, aljazeera.com. For more discussion, should you want it, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or our Twitter handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.